These are high performing AGB video cards. The thing is, these video cards are way faster than most systems with the AGP slot can handle, easily being bottlenecked by CPUs of their time. I'm not absolutely sure why these video cards exist, because they were released for the old AGP bus in a time when the PCI Express expansion bus was already the norm. And that leads to the one thing all of these video cards have in common, the PCI Express to AGP bridge chip. Because these video card projects were for the PCI Express bus, they need to be converted to AGP. Therefore, they have an extra chip on board specifically to bridge the PCI Express interface they were designed to work on to the AGP bus. Considering the amount of work it took to adapt these video cards to work on the AGP bus, I can only assume there was still a big market for them. One that was dying, but it was still breathing and demanding GPUs. <laughs> so, to be able to test these fast AGP video cards, we need something strange. We need a motherboard that supports a fast and modern CPU, but still has the AGP slot. And to get such a motherboard, I'd love to actually go to a brick and mortar store and look for one. And if I lived in Sao Paulo, I could probably find something as they have a huge market for older parts and stores that are dedicated to that. But here in Brasilia, all we have is one street with a few shops and they carry mostly newer stuff. So I ended up getting this one over the internet as usual. So this is the motherboard I found that fits the bill, the Asus PVP EVM. Did you guys hear that? I thought I heard something. Anyway, the ASUS PVP EVM motherboard is one of those strange things. It supports Conroe based Core 2 Duos and it has the AGP slot we've been looking for. When I buy retro parts online, they usually come in bundles. And this one was no different. It was bundled with a CPU and some RAM. And the original CPU that came in this bundle was the Celeron D331. It's based on the Netburst microarchitecture. The first Netburst CPUs were Pentium 4s released in the year 2000. So by 2006, when the core microarchitecture came out with Core 2 Duos, Netburst was already 6 years old. I'm sure you know that 6 years in CPU development is a long, long time. Our ASUS P5P EVM motherboard sports the Intel 865G chipset that was released in 2003 and it was in the top of the mainstream market segment being able to support DDR400 and dual channel and AGP8X for the fastest possible data transfer rate within that port. As for the market for this motherboard, there's a very specific group of people I can guess that would choose to buy this. It's the people that had a perfectly working system with some sort of Pentium or Celeron CPU and an AGP video card and their motherboard failed. So you didn't want to buy a whole new computer with a new CPU and video card, but you wanted the option to upgrade to a new CPU later while keeping your current CPU, video card and everything else. This motherboard is perfect for that case. Originally, this chipset was only rated for up to an 800 MHz front side bus. So I have no idea how they got it to support Core 2 Duo CPUs that run at 1066. But support is listed everywhere you look and you do need a BIOS update which of course I did manage to do after trying a bazillion different lines. And now it's updated to the BIOS version 1501 from 2006. As for the CPU bundled with the system, a Celeron D331, it has got a 2.66 GHz clock runs on a 533 frontside bus and it's got an awkward tiny amount of L2 cache of 256 kilobytes. This CPU was released in 2005, so a decent fit for our premise of someone that needed a new motherboard for a system they already had. The Celeron D that came in the bundle is a bonus for me, but of course that CPU will not cut it for our benchmarking needs. The whole point of getting this motherboard was to be able to use it with a faster CPU. So the CPU we're going to be using is a Core 2 Duo E6600 from 2006. It's not the fastest Core 2 Duo, but it's light years ahead of our Celi D with 4 megabytes of L2 cache, a massive upgrade from the 256 kilobytes, 16 times more. It's got two cores running at 2.4 gigahertz. It might not seem much compared to the one core at 2.66 of the Celeron, but Conroe based CPUs have an IPC bump compared to Netburst and hopefully what we got here is enough to benchmark some of the fastest AGP video cards made. 
Just to make sure the video cards will take advantage of the new CPU, I'm going to run the system with both CPUs and do a little chart comparison of the benchmarks that were timely for this system with the video cards. That would be software released around 2006. Let's start with the slowest video card I got out for today, the G4 6800 XT, AGP of course. This one has got interesting features. You can see that it was designed for a high-end system. It has got some LEDs that illuminate the logo from the back. That was not common at all in 2005 when this card was released. So a beautiful XFX video card. We're starting with 3D Mark 2006. And this one scared me for a bit because for 3D Mark itself, the 6800 XT saw little benefit in the CPU upgrade. But as we're going to see in the other titles, this was an exception. Next we got is the in-game benchmark for Fear. The game is from 2005 and on this one we saw significant results by doing the upgrade. Considering the minimum frame rates with the game not ever dropping under 25 FPS with the E6600 and with the Celeron D having 12% of the frames under 25 and reaching lows of 19. For the next one we have the benchmark tool in Far Cry 2. This one from 2007 and definitely a massive difference with FPS reaching as much as double with the E6600 than what we got with the Celeron. Last but not least with the 6800 XT we have the benchmark tool included in Crysis. Yeah if you didn't know Crysis does have included a GPU and CPU benchmarking tool. Pretty cool. You might think this is the same as Far Cry 2, but it's not quite the same. Far Cry 2 used a spin-off Crysis CryEngine rebranded as Dunia. Nevertheless, great results on Crysis as well, with the E6600 delivering close to twice as many frames per second as the Celeron D. Next video card in the lineup is the 7800 GS. This one was also released in 2006. It doesn't have the LED lighting of the 6800 XT, but it does have a metal bracket on top like the other card. That's useful for inserting them in the slot as well as removing. A bonus for this video card compared to the 6800 is the backplate. Really cool that they have included some sort of backplate in the 7800 GS. Another pretty cool AGP video card. Like the 6800 XT, the 7800 GS also comes with 256 megabytes of GDDR3, but it does have improvements in the render configuration and clock speeds and that should give it quite the edge. I'm eager to see the speed difference that it will show with both CPUs. And we run the benchmarks again, the same ones, so I'm not going to bore you to death by repeating them over and over and over. I'll just build the graph with the data we got and I'll insert the new data as we get it so we can compare results. For now, we have the 6800 XT with the Celeron D and the E6600 Core 2 Duo. In Far Cry 2 in Crisis, the CPU was a clear big bottleneck as we saw almost double the performance with the upgrade. Not as much with Fear, although the numbers don't tell the full story because they are only the average frame rate and we did see significant improvements on the minimum frame rate. For the graph to make any sense, I have divided the 3D Mark 6 scores by 100, so keep that in mind. Now adding the results of the 7800GS, this is getting interestingly intricate. With the Celeron D, we still see the 7800GS has a tiny advantage over the 6800XT, but setting it loose with the Core 2 Duo, wow! I didn't know it was so much more powerful than the 6800, basically doubling the performance on everything we tested. For the red side of the force, we have two video cards from ATI slash AMD. This is the HD3850. This one was released a bit later in 2008. By this time, ATI had been bought over by AMD for two years already. And this video card is known to be the fastest video card released for the AGP bus. I love the design with the big flat blower fan and the blue color. Back in the day, I owned a PCI Express version of the 3850 and I was very much impressed by it. Let's see how it does with the setup and the AGP bus. And we run all the tests again and go one step further in our AGP benchmark bar graph. Using the Celly D CPU, we got a bump on 3D Mark, Far Cry 2 and Crisis, but not on Fear. Surprisingly, the average frame rate was a bit lower, but sometimes when you pair a powerful GPU with a not so powerful CPU, you get unpredictable results. 
With the Core 2 Duo, we really see what the HD3850 is capable of in 3D Mark, more than doubling the results of the 7800GS. On Fear, we also got a huge bump, and we did see some improvement on Far Cry 2 and Crisis, but nothing really out of the ordinary. We might be pushing the limits of the Core 2 Duo now. And now for the last video card test, the AMD HD4650. Although the 3850 is the fastest video card, this one was probably the last video card to be made for the AGP bus, also in 2008, but more to the end of the year. This one came with GDDR2, you can find versions with GDDR3, so those would be a bit faster. For some reason, this video card doesn't work with the Celeron CPU. I don't know why, but I know it's a specific issue with the Celi because it works perfectly with the Core 2 Duo. It could be something related to the use of L2 cache, and since the Celeron has basically none, it gets into trouble. Windows starts up, but it's extremely unresponsive and therefore unusable. But since it works just fine with the E6600, we can add those numbers to the graph and finally get to its final form. This video card does throw a curveball in what seemed to be a pretty straightforward conclusion. From the results in 3D Mark 06 and Fear, the 3850 is clearly faster than the 4650, but the 4650 scores a tiny bit higher in Crisis and Far Cry 2. Might be driver related or also related to the fact that we could be reaching the core to do a limit with the HD 3850. I'm pretty happy with the results of this new AGP test platform, it seems to me we have a bit of headroom and enough performance to push pretty much any video card except maybe the absolute fastest. The 3850 might be a bit too much, but at this point there's not a lot we can do. And tell me what you think, I'd love to see your thoughts about the subject in the comment section. If you're still here, Thank you so much for staying till the end. It's an absolute pleasure sharing this kind of stuff with you guys. And if you have a friend that you think might enjoy this sort of content, why not share it with them? It'll really, really help the channel. Subscribe and I'll see you next time. Oh wait, while they're here, why not check out this video? It's about an old car that can still pull its weight, the Radeon R9 380X.